Okay, hey everybody, good morning. Welcome to REST session seven. Uh, we're gonna be talking about RNNs and the uh, implementation specific details. Um, before we get started, a quick reminder, today is the early submission deadline for homework two, part two. Hopefully everybody has submitted a valid CSV to Kaggle. If not, make sure you do so by tonight. Um, oh yeah, and, uh, these are your favorite TAs, Danish and David. Uh, so. Let's recap on uh, Professor Bixha's lecture stuff. Uh, we've seen that RNNs are these magical beasts, uh, infinite memories or infinite response systems. They can handle many different types of time series data um, and have led to significant advancements in uh, fields like NLP, things like uh, language or machine translation, speech recognition, speech synthesis, etc. cetera. Um, I'm sure most of you have seen the example of how uh, Google Translate all of a sudden like overnight became like actually good. Uh, this because they switched over to an RNN-based uh, machine translation system. Uh, we've also seen that RNNs are pretty hard to train. Um, saturation is a big problem. Gradient, uh, uh, vanishing and exploding gradients is a, a huge problem. Uh, the lost surfaces are uh, generally um, extremely complex. Uh, it's very easy to get stuck in a bad local uh, optima. Uh, local minima, and um, dropout doesn't tend to work so well because it inhibits the, the memorization capabilities, especially in the earlier phase of training. Um, you've seen architectures like LSTMs and GRUs that try to address some of these issues. Still not perfect. It's, it's still a bit difficult to train these things. Um, in real life, when you do decide to train an RNN, you're going to be spending most of your time doing hyperparameter tuning uh, to, to get like decent results. Uh, or you're going to be looking for hacks in papers. Um, news for you guys, they're also extremely hard to implement. Uh, coding them up is uh, significantly harder than it is to code up a CNN or just a regular MLP, and uh, we're going to go through that together today in this recitation. So um, we will be working with um, an example application. It's a language model. You guys have probably seen it before if you've done any other like LTI, NLP type class. Um, but we're going to do it with uh, RNNs and PyTorch. So here's like a, a plan for today. We're going to be talking about our example language models. Uh, then we're going to go over the um, PyTorch specific details of the uh, RNN module. Um, then we're going to look at how to actually train an RNN in, uh, in PyTorch. And we're going to look at uh, generating sequences using this RNN. And we're also going to talk about the challenges associated with uh, variable length inputs. So if that doesn't make sense, that's fine. It will soon, hopefully. So as you've seen, there are many different types of uh, sequence-based problems uh, that RNNs can be applied to. Uh, text classification is an example of a many-to-one, where you have a time series input, and your output classification is going to be a, a single uh, either classification or a prediction vector. Uh, sentence generation is something uh, where you uh, end up with a one-to-many type situation, where you are generating a sequence from um, a fixed length input. Uh, there are two different types of uh, many-to-many uh, problems that uh, RNNs can solve. One of them is uh, like in machine translation where you start generating your output sequence after you've seen all of your input sequence. And the other one is POS tagging or language model type situation where you're generating an output time step in your sequence for every input time step. So let's talk about language models. Um, the goal is to predict the probability of a sentence occurring. Um, so how likely is it that this is a legit English sentence? Um, it's useful, um, especially as a subtask in many different uh, language problems, like uh, uh, speech recognition. You will probably be using this in uh, homework four. Um, so building a language model is an unsupervised task. You don't, uh, it's, it's a, and it's a many-to-many, -many, as we uh, mentioned before. So, okay, um, in a language model, the probability of a sentence happening is the probability of each of its individual uh, words or symbols. You could either be a character level or word level. Um, the inputs are your words that appear E1, E2 being the first and the second word, all the way to EM minus 1. Your outputs are going to be the predicted next word, uh, given all the previous words that have occurred. Does that make sense? Any, yeah, if anyone has any questions, since it's such a full class, just stop me at any time. <laughs> All right. um, so uh, we can train this with cross-entropy, because we're essentially making a prediction of, you know, at every time step, what is the next word going to be. Um, so you guys have all definitely attended or watched uh, Professor Bixia's lectures on RNNs, so this should be a very familiar looking slide to you. 
the idea is that um, we have uh, the memory going through from the hidden state at one time step to the hidden state at the next time step. So how do people do language models like without this, this uh, magic infinite memory type thing? Um, people make the n-gram assumption, that is, uh, the, the word at a specific time step is only dependent on n words that came before it. In a trigram, it's the, the three words before it, et cetera. Um, RNNs have, the, uh, have infinite memory, so we don't need to make that assumption. Um, OK. Now we're going to talk about RNNs in PyTorch. So um, like your CNN or your conv1d or conv2d, uh, you can simply do uh, nn.rnn to initialize your, your uh, RNN layer. Uh, it takes as input um, you know, the number of size, which is the, your input dimensionality, uh, the hidden size, which is going to be the dimensionality of the hidden representation. It also takes uh, a number of layers. Uh, so this is simply the number of recurrent layers that you have. Uh, and there's going to be a shared hidden state between uh, each layer uh, across different time steps. Um, the input size at uh, the forward is a sequence length by batch size uh, by the input dimensionality. Uh, note that it's not the traditional batch size comes first that we're used to when uh, doing uh, MLPs or continents. Uh, and the output is going to be the same size, plus it's also going to give you the hidden state at the final time step. So, okay, the outputs are going to be exactly the hidden, step, uh, the hi hidden states at the final layer. So your, um, uh, your output at the last time step is going to be your hidden at the last time step. Uh, it's very similar to uh, work with other RNN uh, recurrent classes in PyTorch, like LSTMs and GRUs. Only one thing that's uh, um, different is in LSTMs, your hidden state is actually a, a tuple of uh, the, hidden, uh, the hidden state as well as the memory cell. Oftentimes, especially in this course, you may want more flexibility and control um, over what is happening as your uh, network loops through the time series. So maybe you wouldn't want to use the, the full RNN. Instead, you could use the RNN cell. Um, this is just a simple, uh, again, it's an NN module, so you can uh, initialize it using nn.rnn cell. And this would take in its forward um, each time step. So it would be uh, the, the input at that given time step as well as the previous hidden state. Um, if you don't want to provide it a hidden state, it will default to just using a vector of zeros. Um, so now, in a language model, we're going to need a few other layers. Um, one that's pretty uh, common when you're dealing with uh, text-based RNNs is uh, embeddings. Uh, you guys are already familiar with, the, hopefully, familiar with the concept of embeddings from homework two. Uh, this is not too dissimilar. Um, we are going to um, we want a way of representing our words in our language model, um, and the hidden state of the RNN uh, is not going to be of uh, uh, sufficiently high dimensionality for us to represent each class probability for each word appearing. So instead, we have an embedding layer that simply uh, takes the hidden representation from the recurrent layer and uh, transforms that into the class probabilities of each word appearing. Um, also, like uh, another thing that you can do is have that embedding um, as a layer before your RNN, so that you know you have a shared representation um, for the hidden in, like the input to the RNN, as well as the hidden to the uh, hidden to the class probabilities in the output. So the embedding, uh, you can define it simply using the Torch uh, NN module. So NN dot embedding, it takes as input the number of embeddings, uh, as well as your embedding dimension. Um, so if you're using this with a language model, your embedding dimension would need to be the same as your hidden dimension for your RNN. Okay, training a language model. Um, you know, initially, say you have one extremely large, big text, like, uh, I don't know, like the Wikipedia corpus. We don't really um, care about each individual sentence. So what we can do, like super simply, to segment it out into our uh, samples is to pick a fixed sequence length, L, and then split our huge corpus into uh, fixed length inputs of size L and then feed that to our RNN. Um, here, our inputs are going to be L and our outputs, or our, our target labels, our, uh, yeah, our target labels are going to be the same input sentence shifted to the right by one. Uh, 
Uh, why is that? It's because we want to predict the next word at, at um, we want to predict the next word that occurs at every given time step. And we were trained this using uh, cross entropy. Um, a super useful way of evaluating how good your language model is performing is a metric uh, known as perplexity. So the way that you'd compute that is you would calculate your cross entropy loss per word, and then uh, you would take the exponent of that. Um, it quantifies how well your, your um, model is predicting that given sentence. Um, loosely speaking, if you know, your model ends up with a perplexity of um, 100 on your test set, uh, that's equivalent to your model, uh, uh, that the performance is close to that of your model having to pick between um, 100 words for every word, that, uh, every correct label. Okay, so um, in terms of predictions, language models are generally um, used, like I said, uh, downstream of other, um, other larger problems like uh, speech recognition. Um, just like in MLPs for classification, you want to pick your most likely uh, class from your output labels, uh, from your output probability distribution, so you do that using your argmax. Um, generating one word is pretty straightforward. We would feed the RNN the sentence up to that word and then have it predict what the next word would be. Generation is a slightly harder problem. Uh, if you want to generate n words, uh, you have n times the number of words, different possible sequences. Um, so to know each sentence probabilities, you would have to feed all of the n minus one uh, beginnings and then get all the n minus one times the vocabulary size forward passes. That's not really feasible. Uh, so we need a better way of generating uh, n words. So one idea is that um, we just simply use uh, a greedy search, um, which means we're going to feed it the, the first few words. Uh, it predicts its first, the, the, the first word it predicts will be fed into it as the previous word. Uh, so we greedily choose whatever the, the model predicts. I am making sense, right? You guys are following? Yes? OK, cool. Um, so we greedily uh, predict the class, uh, and we pass that back into the RNN as it being the, the previous word that was seen in the sentence. Uh, it's extremely simple um, to implement. It, it works pretty fast, but it's not necessarily the best way of doing it. As you can imagine, especially in like, the earlier stages of training a language model, um, the predictions at a given time step are not going to be um, accurate, uh, and you're going to be feeding that prediction in as being like the ground truth previous time step that it's seen. So it's, it's not the best way of doing it. Random search, um, it, like at first glance, this is going to be, it, it's going to seem like this is a lot worse, but um, at every time step, you would just randomly sample uh, another word and say that that was the, the last word that was seen. Um, it's not going to perform better than the greedy, but you can do this multiple times, and then uh, you end up with multiple possible, um, uh, multiple potential sentences that are generated, and then you can pick the most likely one. And the way that you pick the most likely one is the probability that your language model uh, uh, calculated while generating the sentence. Um, another way of doing it is beam search. So this is very similar to greedy, but um, you're essentially parallelizing your search. Um, at any given time step, you branch out into n different uh, hypotheses. Um, and you pick the n most likely words at every given time step. Um, so at every time step, you're going to end up branching out into multiple potential sentences. And then at every time step, you'd prune down the sentences that have the lowest probability of happening. Um, this is uh, pretty difficult to implement, but it's the one that performs the best. And if you're um, ever reading any papers on a language model, uh, they generally tend to use beam search. You're probably going to be coming back to these slides for homework four. That's, that's pretty much it for language models. Um, not really. So they, we made a big assumption uh, a few slides back. So we said we have this big corpus and we can just split it into equal uh, input sizes of size L. That only works if you have one large corpus and it doesn't matter where you split the sentences. Um, so language models that are trained on large sets like this, it's not an issue. But generally supervised NLP tasks, uh, you're not going to have the luxury of just being able to split your sentences wherever you want. 
Um, we would need to deal with variable length inputs. Um, you are definitely going to need this for the upcoming homework. So if you weren't paying attention before, now is the time to start. OK, your data set now has a list of, of n different sentences or input sequences. Each one is a different length. But the tensors that you're going to be passing to your, uh, your PyTorch model um, have to be fixed dimensions. So how are you going to batch stuff if they're all different lengths? It's, it's, there are a bunch of different um, ideas, so let's go through them. First one, just use batch size of one. It doesn't matter. I mean, like, uh, you know, the, the dimensionality is going to be the same. It's just the length that's different. So if you use a batch size of one, you don't have to worry about it. This is the simplest. It's almost trivial to code. Problem is, it is extremely slow. You are going to burn through thousands of dollars in AWS credits before you can hit like, the C or the random baseline. Don't do it. It's not worth it. Um, you can start with it to check that you know, your data loader is working and everything is fine, but you know, for, anything, uh, it's, it's, yeah, for anything reasonable, this, this is not going to work. Idea two. Um, oh, yes. Go for it. Even if you use batch size of one, mm -hmm. your network will still expect the same input size for all batches. It's going to expect the same input dimensionality. So in homework two, part one, um, we have a time series. Um, the dimensionality of that is, what was it, 24? Um, but the length, yeah, your, your model would be um, it's 128, but it, uh, for an RNN, it doesn't matter how long it is. So the length doesn't make a difference um, unless you're batching. Because if you're batching, it's going to be one tensor, that length would have to be fixed. You can't have a tensor where every row has a different length. right? Um, Another thing, since you brought me back to this slide, is uh, even if you end up using a batch size of one, you could still use the mini batch, like gradient hack. Um, you just would do your step after a bunch of backwards. You let the gradients accumulate, and then you, uh, and then after you do your optimizer step. All right. So idea two um, would be to just group all the um, all the sequences that are exactly the same length, uh, group them together into a batch. Uh, this would be fast, it's pretty straightforward to code it, um, but the problem is your data almost uh, always would not have this nice feature that has multiple sequences of the same length. Um, and finding several pairs with the same length enough to make like a significantly large batch for it to speed up anything, probably not going to happen. Uh, if you definitely can, if you're 100% sure you know your data and you can do it, then go for it. Otherwise, don't. Hint, you can't do this for the homeworks in this course. The data will not permit it. OK, here's another idea. We can look for sequences that are close enough in length and then pad the rest so that you know, they end up at the same size. Um, it's kind of fast because you know, it's, it's pretty easy to find sequences that are similar length. And your data would permit it, depending on what your threshold is for like close in length. And padding is super easy in PyTorch. The problem is um, padding uh, a, a time series, it, it, there's no natural way of doing it. So what ends up happening is when you compute your loss, you're going to be computing loss on this, this noisy stuff that was generated on like padded inputs. That's going to mess up your backpropagation because your gradients are now going to be messy. Don't do it. Idea four. Let's do the same thing. Let's pad out your data. Um, but then let's remove these noisy elements before computing the loss. So what does this mean? Um, the way we compute the loss generally is you know, we just <coughs> pass it through our, uh, our uh, cross entropy, and we end up with a scalar loss. We do loss that backwards. Um, instead of computing or reducing it down to the scalar loss, if we have the element-wise loss, we can zero out the loss terms that were computed using the padded input. That way, when we, we do reduce them afterwards and then do the backwards, there are going to be no gradients that resulted from the padded input. So this is like, um, you need to get this for the other homework. So if uh, anybody has any issues on Piazza, you know, put a post there. Or if you have questions here, ask now. Um, masking is. Pretty straightforward. You just need to keep track of your input sequence lengths. And then after you've computed the loss, you can just have a tensor of the same size. 
with ones where they are legit outputs and zeros where these outputs were generated from the padding terms. Then you just do element-wise multiplication, that zeros out the losses you don't want to be backpropagating on. Then you can just take the average and do loss that backwards. Okay, the advantages, it's pretty fast, it's pretty easy to do. PyTorch does provide like inbuilt functions for, uh, for padding sequences, specifically like um, for RNN util stuff, and that uh, helps out a lot. It's still not the best way of doing it because um, when you pad, you're wasting time um, when your model is computing, <clears throat> your model is performing computations on padded data. Right? Like uh, this is data that you're not even gonna be using to, to train. So um, you could end up slowing down your overall training time. This is the method, one of the methods that we recommend like to start off with when you're training RNNs. Um, but you should be careful because remember that you don't necessarily have control over how large your batch is going to be in terms of how much memory it's gonna take because that depends on the length. So you could end up with uh, CUDA errors where you run out of memory. And uh, you know, that just kills your entire program. So be careful when you, uh, when you do things like this. Okay, idea number five. Um, in order to get rid of you know, the unnecessary computations on the zeros, why not uh, pad using useful computation? Um, you know, like slicing out the beginning of a, uh, another sequence and then padding using that. That way we're not wasting time computing outputs on the, the zero padding. Uh, instead, we're just arranging the input in a way that it fits within one tensor. This is the fastest way, I think, that you can do it. Problem is, it is uh, almost impossible for you, anybody, okay, for us to be able to do this uh, in a 100% bug-free uh, manner. You're going to need godlike engineering skills to get this right the first time um, and get it running fast and correct. Don't. Don't, don't try. The godlike people at Facebook <laughs> did it for us. Um, PyTorch has a uh, entire um, type of packed sequences. This is exactly what they do. They pack the sequences in together so that you don't waste time um, computing outputs on the padded data. Um, the advantage of this, it's the fastest, it's the easiest since PyTorch supports it. There's a lot of documentation on it. Uh, the RNN modules in PyTorch are optimized to be uh, using these as the inputs. Now, they would work with regular tensors, but they're optimized for these packed sequences. You are going to need to pad at some point um, because it's not just an RNN that you're going to be using. You're going to be, uh, you'll have your uh, embedding or linear layers at some point. Um, so when you're padding, you could still run into those CUDA memory issues, so you should still be careful. Um, and you have to keep track of the lengths of your tensors uh, or the lengths of your input sequences before you pack them because as you can imagine, it gets kind of complicated to keep track of where one sequence ends and the other one begins. That's something you explicitly have to do by maintaining the um, order or the, the lengths of the input sequences and you're going to have to sort them before passing them to your packed sequences. We're going to go over this. So. Um, PyTorch offers um, the nnutils.rnn module. These are just a bunch of super useful helper functions when you're trying to do like data processing uh, for your RNNs. Um, so here, uh, it's a, just a quick example of the pad sequence. It works as you would expect. It pads it to be the longest. Um, batch first is a flag that you'd pass this uh, to let it know what you want the output shape to be. Um, it's just going to permute or transpose your um, output so that the batch size comes first. Okay, padding and packing sequences. We're just going to talk about the pack sequence first. Um, if you just uh, pass your, uh, a list of your input time sequences to the um, RNN utils pack sequences, uh, it will throw an error. Like I said, they have to be sorted in terms of the uh, sequence length. Um, so the, the longest uh, sample will go first, followed by the next longest, and so on. Um, and you, yeah, so you sort it, you need to maintain that order that you sorted it in. This is especially important when you're doing your evaluation, otherwise you end up with predictions, but all of a sudden they're not sorted in, in the way that they're supposed to be. So you end up with bad Kaggle scores. Um, 
they also provide ways for you to go straight from padded sequences to the packed sequences. Um, and this is the way that we recommend you guys do it. It's using the um, RNN utils uh, pad, uh, pack padded sequences and pad packed sequences. The first one takes a padded sequence, a PyTorch padded sequence, um, and will uh, and the lengths, the uh, a tensor or a list, a Python list of lengths of each of the original input sequences, and will produce a packed sequence, which is the super compact uh, optimized input that's going to go into your RNN. After you get your output from the RNN, it's also going to be a packed sequence. If the input was a packed sequence, you're going to want to unpack it. And the way you do that is using pad packed sequence. I'm not doing this enough justice, but there's a ton of documentation out there. Like I said, this is like a PyTorch supported uh, util. So you can go home and read about it. So the packed sequence can only be fed to RNNs. It's not going to work with uh, your linear layers or your convolution layers. Um, so you're going to have to make some modifications to your overall network uh, if you are going to be using the uh, packed sequences. Um, a simple example would be if you have a linear layer um, to extract some features followed by your RNN followed by another linear layer. In your forward for your network, um, you're going to get the regular sequences, your padded sequences. You're going to uh, pass them through your linear layer. The output of your linear layer will then have to be packed, passed through the RNN, and then unpacked using the pad packed sequences function, and then passed into the next linear layer and so on. Okay. So uh, next, David's going to walk you through uh, a Jupyter Notebook example of this stuff. Um, one paper that I will point you guys to, these slides are not up on the website yet, but they will be by the end of today, uh, is a paper that has all these, um, uh, has a bunch of hacks, tips, and tricks on how to train um, LSTMs as language models. Um, bookmark it or whatever, you're going to need it for uh, homework four and the last part of homework three. Um, yeah, that's about it. We're going to cover CTC in the next recitation. We're going to cover the encoder-decoder architecture with attention in the recitation following that. Uh, any questions? Are there any questions on Piazza? Of course. <laughs> no? All righty. Uh, I just plug your HDMI cable. Go for it. Do that while I unmic myself. All right, so here is a notebook that will go through like a, how you implement a language model in PyTorch. Can you see this? Should I make it bigger? <coughs> All right, so um, this is import statements basically and uh, declaring your device. This is um, what Donish was talking about with where you get the pack padded sequence and all those type of uh, useful utilities. And then this thing, uh, that's this file. Could you zoom in on it and make it bigger? Yeah, sure. Okay. Cool. Um, so this is like a utilities file for dealing with text. So this language model is trained on Shakespeare data. Um, so this is just like reading um, and like joining together every line from the text. Um, this is just creating a dictionary mapping characters to indices because one thing with a character model is that you can't actually use uh, a string in your implementation for anything like in PyTorch. So you have to use the index of your um, vocabulary. So you have to create a vocabulary and then index into that um, and that represents your character. So this uh, 
it takes every character in your text and returns the index from the dictionary. This is something that you can use. Um, this is just turning the, um, the indices back into text so you can read it. Um, and that's pretty much the idea. So credit to Raphael for most of the code in here. So here we're just reading the corpus, um, printing some of the characters. Here is where we're getting the, uh, the mapping and then the actual characters that are found in here. Um, so if you look at, this is some of the, this is like the first 203 and the last 50 characters. So you have the sonnets by William Shakespeare. <clears throat> and then here's some small example that I created. Um, so if you look at it as uh, like the actual small example itself, it's these list of indices. Then if you show it as the characters, here you see the actual characters. And then here is that utility I was talking about where you turn it into a text. And uh, Donish was talking about how when you're training a language model, the input and the uh, output are just the same sequence shifted by one. <coughs> so here I, um, I sliced it so you can actually see how it looks. So if your sequence is treasure of thy, you would do treasure of th, and then here you start from the second one and go all the way to the end. So the idea is that when you have this character, your predicted character should be this. And then when you have this character, you should be predicting this. <clears throat> so now we're going to get into, um, this is fixed length input. So this is what Donish was talking about originally. So since we have this whole um, corpus of Shakespeare, we could arbitrarily split it up into sequence length uh, inputs. And then we just slice. This is so that. Um, this is so you like have an even number of batches. And then here you're viewing it by n uh, and sequence length. So this will be like the number of batches that you have of sequence length. Then here's another thing that you'll have to use a lot for uh, RNNs in PyTorch. It's a collate function. So it's going to take in what you uh, return from get item. And it's something that you can use to like adjust uh, your inputs. So uh, from your data loader, it'll actually return what you return from collate. So in collate, for RNNs, a lot of the time, this is where you're going to do the sorting of your data for variable lengths. Um, so you're also like eventually going to want to return the lengths of your data uh, in the collate function. For now, for just because this is sequence length, uh, we're just unsqueezing, which is adding a dimension. Um, <clears throat> but generally, collate is something that you're going to want to know about. So here is the, the fixed length language model. The vocab size in a character-based model is going to be relatively small. It'll be something, I think in this we have like 80 characters. Um, and you have your embedding, which goes from vocab size to embed size. So if you're passing in a character to your LSTM, like it kind of doesn't make sense to pass in one index. Like if you're, uh, if you look at the example here, if my input is this, it kind of doesn't make sense to pass in like a vector that says 75. So the way that we account for that is we have this embedding layer, and you put in vocab size because it'll take that. If you have this. It'll take 75, and it'll use that as like a one high encoding uh, from your vocab. And it'll figure out for each of these indices in your vocab, let me calculate an embedding from that. So this will translate each character into an embedding. So one thing that could be a little confusing is if you have like a vector of your characters, then you'll have a matrix with the same number of elements. But instead of one element, now it's embedding size for each element. Let me know if that makes sense or you have questions. <clears throat> so Donish was talking about nn.rnn. Um, most of the time, you're not going to actually use the rnn module. You're going to use LSTM. You can also try out GRUs. I think the training time is faster on those. Um, <clears throat> 
I know some people last semester used them. I've never actually used the GRU, uh, but it's definitely valid. So the, the three components of a language model are always the embedding, the LSTM, RNN, and your scoring. <clears throat> so you take the characters, you pass it in to your embedding layer, you get out the embedding, then that's the input size to your LSTM, and then you return the hidden size. Then from there, your end goal is to predict a probability sequence over your vocabulary. So the linear and the embedding have pretty similar functions. Um, one is going from your vocab to an embedding. The other is going from the embedding of your LSTM and going to your vocabulary size. So to get the character that you predict, you would take uh, the argmax of this self.scoring layer. <laughs> So here's just like the forward for a, uh, the character language model. Um, I, like as I said, you calculate the embedding, you pass it through the RNN. Um, one thing to note is that you, you can pass in uh, a hidden state to your RNN. <clears throat> if you initialize it to none, it's just zeros. Um, it's just good practice to like expressly uh, show what you're initializing to instead of assuming that they know that it's zeros. Um, another thing that you could do is um, you can do like nn.parameter of something. So if you want to have like a, a parameter that you learn um, for your initial hidden state, so that's like h a negative one. So if you want to learn a parameter of like what is the optimal hidden state uh, to pass into the network originally, you could wrap something in nn.parameter and then uh, it'll learn through the backpropagation. <coughs> yeah, so here the forward is going to take in L by n and then when you pass through the embedding, since each element in this is just uh, one single character, which is the index of the character, after you pass through the embedding it becomes this dimension, the one becomes E. You pass it through the RNN and then you get H. Then to pass it um, into your scoring layer you have to flatten it. So then the H turns into the vocab size and then you can take the argmax. And then here's what Donish was talking about with generating text. Basically this is the greedy version. So you would pass in your sequence to your model. Then you would take the, the most probable word and then you feed that back into your model. So with this, you're like uh, you're predicting the final word of the sequence. Then you're taking that and passing it back through your model. <laughs> <coughs> then here is just like a, a training loop that you've seen many times. Um, here is like one of the new parts is perplexity. Um, Yodanish, do you have anything to say about perplexity? Why we use it? Um, yeah. So. Uh, I can just say whatever you said. Um, sure. It's the reason why we. It's the exponent of the entity. Yeah. Um, it's essentially trying to measure um, or approximate um, the performance of the model as compared to if it had to uniformly and independently choose from mm. um, X number of words. Right? Okay. Yeah, another thing that I was told last semester is that it decreases faster than your loss will, so it's a good morale booster. Um, <coughs> so this is just training it. Um, and then, uh, so here, or I guess I can train it again. So this is a pretty simple model that won't perform that well, but it trains quickly for the purpose of this recitation. Um, <coughs> I can reproduce some of this, but this is like previously what I generated. So if you put into the model the sequence to be or not to be, that is the question. Uh, it actually predicts the quiet of, which is, you know, there's some sense to it a little bit. This one has a little bit less sense, but... Um, Generally, if you have a language model nowadays, you're going to want to have an attention mechanism, um, which is kind of what you're going to do for homework four. So you'll have more experience with generating like actual language with that. <coughs>
And now we get to like the more useful kind of code for this, which is the pack sequences. So here is just uh, instead of taking the uh, the corpus and putting it into batches of fixed length, here we're just taking each line as it should be. Um, so here is like the first however many lines of the sonnet, and then here is like a the data set for your packed sequence model. So the key part of this is your collate function. In here, you, you're going to want to sort your lengths. So when you, uh, when you have a packed sequence, you have to sort the lengths of your inputs, and then uh, it'll look kind of like... So if this is the longest sequence, it's going to look like this in structure, like a kind of triangle. So this would be your longest sequence, and then your second longest, and so on. So here's the, the packed version of the model. Uh, the main difference is like the, uh, the init is pretty much the same. The forward is a bit different, because this time we're having the variable length inputs. So here is taking the lengths of each of the sequences. Uh, and then the bounds is finding the index into the list of where the sequences occur. The reason we do that is because here we concatenate the list, so we can pass it through the embedding layer. Um, but then to get the list back again from the concatenated version, you reference from bounds of i to bounds of i plus uh, 1. So this kind of takes each input that you concatenate together and puts it back as the correct individual input. Then here is the, the magic packed sequence. Um, so there, there's kind of two versions that you can do. There's pack sequence and there's pack padded sequence. Um, there's a, a distinction between the two. Generally when I've coded with it, I've used pack padded sequence. And this takes in as input um, a padded uh, tensor, and then you have your pack sequence, which takes as input a list of variable length tensors. So there's kind of a subtle distinction between the two. If you do pack padded sequence, the input is a padded tensor, which you use, uh, I think it's pad sequence. Or th there's some pad function in uh, PyTorch, and so you would pass in your tensor to here, and it returns. Um, <clears throat> it's going to actually have the same dimensions uh, in, like, so it'll have the same dimension as the longest length that you have in your input. So it'll match all of the smaller lengths to the largest one. The pack sequence, you're not actually doing any of the padding explicitly. You have this list of variable length tensors, and then you pass it into here. So here we're doing that. Then again, we initialize it in. Then we pass it through again. Um, and the rest of this is pretty similar. The only other thing is that you're concatenating here. Um, and when, when you're dealing with uh, packed sequences, you always want to keep track of your lengths. So you want to store that uh, in pretty much every function that you have. Uh, then here's another generate. This is pretty similar. Um, it's kind of useful to look at the dimensions here. So you have your sequence length by vocab size. Um, and then you're going to pass it into the embedding. Then you pass it through the RNN. And then to get the current word, now you have a one by one. Uh, and then you pass that back into the embedding. And then you get a one by embedding size. Then here is like a just training an epoch of the packed sequence. And here's initializing models. And then here's more training. <clears throat> and then I predicted the same sequence with the, the packed model. Um, instead of the quiet of, it is the quarrel. And this one makes a little more sense than the previous one, but still. The, these models are pretty small, like layers and hidden unit sizes. So it's, uh, generally with these recitations, we, you shouldn't take the actual architecture from these models and think that it, it will work. Usually that's something you want to look at papers um, to get an idea of. <clears throat>
Um, do you guys have any questions, or do you want me to go back to anything? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we're going to have the slides and the notebook posted to the website today, or if not today, as soon as possible. Yeah. Do Questions about the water in Bali? Yeah. So, so the water in Bali in the Ernando in Bali, right? Uh, does this work as water collector or the results of them are the same or they just work similarly? Um, I think it's similar. Like the idea of word to vec is taking some word and generating an embedding for it, right? If I'm not mistaken. Like my understanding of it is that you're generating an embedding and like in this embedding space, semantically similar words are gonna have like similar embeddings. The idea of this is that um, it's, it's something that you can back propagate through. It's essentially like a linear layer and you're transferring the, the index of the character into some like discrete space that you can learn through backprop. Yeah. 